Hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Susan Sanchez Casal, Director of Tufts in Madrid. And on behalf of the Office of Tufts Global Education and our co-sponsors for today's panel, the German program and the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life, I welcome all of you to the second event in our, of our Spring Global Speaker Series, Critical Times, Critical Thinkers. This series presents wide-ranging perspectives on compelling contemporary issues, offering a platform for ways of thinking and doing around the globe that challenge and expand how we see the world that we share. Today's panel will examine the fraught relationship between social media and democracy in the global North and South and features esteemed thought leaders from Germany, India, and Denmark. The panel will be moderated by Dr. Josephine Wolf, Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity Policy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Dr. Wolf joined the faculty of the Fletcher School in 2019. Her research interests include international internet governance, security responsibilities and liability of online intermediaries, and the legal, political, and economic consequences of cybersecurity incidents. Her book, You'll See This Message When It Is Too Late, The Legal and Economic Aftermath of Cybersecurity Breaches, was published by MIT Press in 2018. Dr. Wolf's writing on cybersecurity has also appeared in Slate, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Wired. Thanks so much for participating in this panel, Josephine. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Susan, and thank you for convening us here today. I'm really excited about this panel. I think for those of us in the United States, um, there's been an enormous amount of attention and focus on social media platforms and who's allowed to use them and who's been banned from them, especially around the election at the end of last year. And it, it's often, I think, a, a sort of story that we get very caught up in in our own little domestic uh, news bubbles and don't always take time to recognize and appreciate what a complicated and international uh, evolving situation we have when we think about these issues of digital speech, disinformation, and censorship. So I'm really thrilled that we have three incredible speakers here today from three different countries to talk a little bit about their own work, their own encounters with these types of platforms, and their perspectives on how the situation in different parts of the world is evolving, what things are working well, what things are not working well when we think about how social media platforms should be regulated, and what we can learn by sort of looking across these different situations in different places, different countries around the world, and try to learn from each other to understand how we can do a better job moving forward. So I'm going to introduce the three panelists and let each of them speak briefly to sort of talk a little bit about their perspectives. Then I'm going to ask them some questions, and then I'm going to invite all of you to ask some questions as well. So please be thinking about that. I'm going to, to turn that over to you towards the end of our hour. I'm joined today by three really remarkable panelists with a, a diversity of expertise. First, we have Manuela Caspar Claridge, who's the editor in chief of Deutsche Welle, a German international broadcaster. She's also on the communications and media committee of the German Chambers of Industry and Commerce, as well as the CIVIS advisory board. I'm also joined by Rohini Lakshane, who is a technologist, Wikimedian, and public policy researcher. An engineer by training, Rohini has worked on several research and advocacy projects at the intersection of technology, policy, and civil liberties. And finally, we're joined by Adam Fedjerskov, who's a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies. His work lies at the intersection of inequalities, technology, and science in the global south. So Manuela, I want to come to you first. Tell us a little bit about sort of what your experience has been thinking about digital speech and disinformation from your perspective as a journalist and where you see this moving in the future. Thank you uh, for the opportunity and greetings from Berlin. I'm here in my home office. Let me first uh, tell you a bit about Deutsche Welle. We are Germany's international broadcaster. We are broadcasting in 30 different languages. And you can compare us with uh, BBC World. We have a huge uh, audience. And we have around 3,000 journalists working for us all over the world. And all these journalists are faced with a lot of uh, hate speech and uh, doing their work also with fake news. And um, uh, me as an editor in chief, I often have to try to protect my colleagues. Uh, with regards to hate speech on online forums, for example, when we publish an opinion piece, uh, 
by a journalist. They are very quickly attacked by right-wing groups. And so uh, very often we have to take off the commentary uh, function or the opinion function, you know, that you can add your comments, your personal comments to the opinion piece. And uh, this is a very difficult situation often for journalists. And sometimes we even have to let them write uh, anonymous uh, uh, without giving their uh, a real name. So that's the situation we are in. In Germany, we have a fierce debate about the fight against hate speech on the one side and the importance of civil liberties such as free speech and privacy on the other side. The German government attempted to balance these twin commitments, if I may say so, with the so-called Network Enforcement Act, which was passed in 2017. And it requires platforms like Facebook to quickly take down hate speech, otherwise they are uh, they are facing uh, big fines. So this is the theory. We have a law implemented, but the fact is we still have a lot of hate speech, a lot of fa fake uh, news, and the debate is going on. Obviously, uh, these measures which were implemented don't work very well because, you know, it takes time until uh, hate speech is taken down from the platforms and so on. Not enough people are checking that at Facebook and all the other platforms. So this is a real problem for us here in Germany. And even uh, we had a, a small storm on the uh, parliament last year, uh, year in August, a small group of right-wing attackers attempted to storm the German parliament in Berlin and they organized uh, themselves through social media platforms. So you just see uh, how big the problem can be with allowing everything on the uh, social media platforms. But of course, as a journalist, I'm an advocate of free speech. This goes without saying really. Thank you so much. Rohini, I'm curious what you've been observing with your work in India and what sorts of platforms and challenges you've seen there. I think you're muted still. Yes, thank you. I wasn't able to unmute myself on my own. Um, so, in addition to the uh, introduction that Josephine gave, I used to be a journalist in a previous career. So I completely, uh, I, my thoughts completely resonate with Manuela's uh, just on that note where you ended. Uh, I uh, work at a small techno-feminist collective now called the Bachao Project. Uh, and one of my major areas of work in the past few years has been the topic of intentional internet shutdowns. Now, uh, these are, uh, blackouts, these are shutdowns of the internet initiated by the government, and this is an extreme form of censorship. Um, uh, it, it could either be a switch off, or it could be that uh, uh, the internet speeds are being throttled. So on the face of it, it's not uh, that the internet has been completely cut off, but the speeds are so slow that it's practically unusable. Now, India has year after year clocked the highest number of intentional internet shutdowns uh, initiated by the state across the world. And um, these are just the registered, the recorded number of shutdowns. We don't even know how many have gone unrecorded. And they tend to be frequent, they tend to be prolonged. Uh, for example, uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, 4G internet was restored about two weeks ago after almost 550 days, after almost 18 months of uh, internet blackout, the longest running shutdown ever in a democracy and the world's largest democracy at that. And the reasons cited for these shutdowns are curbing fake news, curbing the spread of misinformation, rumor mongering, spread of propaganda and uh, ideologies, targeted messaging to propagate terrorism, controlling the activities of anti-national elements without specifying uh, how anti-national elements are defined and identified and classified. And a shutdown is often imposed uh, in the event of, say, public protests or a situation of public unrest or violence. Uh, 
which is already happening or is likely to happen uh, in the judgment of the government. So um, when a public notice is issued, sometimes it's not, but when a public notice is issued, uh, uh, the justification given uh, for the shutdown is that uh, the government needs to maintain law and order or the government needs to maintain security and peace and therefore they are shutting down the internet uh, to prevent uh, uh, further you know, malicious rumors or, or to, to prevent further fake news and misinformation or the other things that I said with uh, relation to terrorism. Um, now, there's no evidence really, nothing to support uh, this claim that uh, cutting off the internet, uh, a blanket uh, shutdown of the internet will prevent uh, an already brewing situation of violence or unrest from escalating or will prevent it from happening in the first place. Uh, this is something for which we've never gotten an answer from the government and we can see governments across the world are catching up on this, um, using similar justifications, uh, using similar language for controlling information as well as for uh, shutting down the internet. In the neighboring Myanmar, which is an outpost of democracy, so to speak, a shutdown was imposed in two states for more than two years. Uh, it was restored for about five months. And then early this month, a military coup happened in Myanmar. Uh, and there was a near total shutdown of the internet imposed across the country. This was also in response to public protests uh, in support of democracy and officials cited security requirements and public interest as the reason for uh, the internet shutdown. So that was my first uh, observation. That's that's the first trend I can see. The other is um, uh, the, the difference between how uh, social media companies, big tech companies, uh, interact with the government in I'd say the, the global north versus the global south, although I find these terms a little loaded, but um, um, uh, the, the, the sheer power play between uh, corporates and governments in, in uh, democracies in, in the global north versus those in the global south. Uh, so, for example, President Trump was banned after uh, the mob incidents of mob violence on Capitol Hill uh, across a different, you know, across a bunch of different platforms. Uh, and this really happened when he was on his way out anyway. While he was in office, uh, the boundaries of what was permissible on social media in terms of misinformation and unsubstantiated statements or, you know, unsupported, unreferenced statements, uh, those, those boundaries got pushed. Whereas um, early this month in India, the government asked Twitter to block uh, a few hundred Twitter accounts. Uh, we don't know how many those those were, but uh, about 250 got blocked. These accounts comprised activists, political commentators, a news publication, even a movie actor, uh, and, and a government official himself. Uh, and apart from the government official, everyone else was um critical of the government although there is there has been no public clarification from the government on this in incident so these accounts remained inaccessible in india for about uh, a few for a few hours about six hours or so and then twitter restored them uh while trying to talk to the government uh, suggesting that it was not uh, uh, a good idea to block entire accounts. Uh, if if the government could point out offending tweets, that's that's a different matter. Uh, and not complying with a government order may have invited legal punitive action for Twitter's employees, including jail time and fines. So, uh, you know, Trump got deplatformed uh, in in the U.S. But what may have made the difference in these two situations, maybe local laws, uh, the de facto and de jure authority and power that public institutions have in these countries and the systems and structures of checks and balances. Thank you.
Adam, I want to come to you to give us a little bit of historical perspective on social media and also some of your thoughts on the role of digital technologies as these political technologies. Thank you so much, Josephine. And, and let me know if my connection is a bit wobbly. I'm literally in the, sh in the shed outside in my garden to leave my family alone in the house. So Sound great. let me know if, if there is an issue. And thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure. I mean, this, this topic is exceedingly pertinent and it seems to only grow every day more or less. So I think it's, it's great to have this conversation. And I'm, I'm happy, more than happy to contribute in the ways that you sort of uh, flesh. For starters, my two sort of points maybe would just be also say in a historical perspective, the radical shift in the narrative and the comprehensive uh, or the comprehension of the the impact that so me uh, the social media has sort of developed over the past decades it's the 10th year anniversary of the arab spring and it's an obvious point of departure to sort of start in terms of you know just reminding ourselves how 10 years ago social media Twitter in particular that were deemed sort of saviors of democracy, bringers of freedom. And they didn't trigger the counter we saw in North Africa, but they did support and facilitate them in part. So the mobilization of people for protests, the dissemination of information to the outside world that were crucial for these counter revolutions to take place. And now if we fast forward 10 years, of course, we've already heard some of the issues that we're dealing with. What an immense change in the narrative and in the understanding we have the media where social technology essentially has become every political as social and where technology have developed in ways that not imagine uh, weaponized to an immense and so i think you know it's 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 interesting to look back across so few years to see how even if we don't act politically, though we do, we understand that democracy to have far really been strong over the past decade and over the past years as well. I think the other point that's important to make here is just for starters to stress the strong difference, the radical difference between the implications we're seeing in Western Europe, in the US, and then when we move our sort of gaze to the global south. So, of course, we've heard and we know about the Russian election meddling in 2016 in the UK following that. But also, you know, in, in Africa where I work, I work mostly in East Africa and Ethiopia. So I, I also follow and know all about internet shutdowns because that is such a strong political tool there. But all African elections essentially in 2019 and 2020 being exposed to very heavy influence uh, from disinformation, including from the Russian side. Of course, we've seen the right-wing insurrection on Capitol Hill, but, but when we look at these issues broadly, I think it's important to note that the consequences, the implications of some of these issues are far, far more tangible and they're far, far more grave once we move to, to, to the global south. We're seeing right now in Iran, the Twitter and death penalty almost go together when it comes to something of like criticism of the government uh, with social media being used as a weapon of repression very much rohini talked about india you know that's also a very you know relevant example right now with hundreds of accounts being blocked and the government when government or when the government asked twitter to do so and indian police publicly thanking twitter and google for quelling the protests and but i think Maybe the most interesting or, or about Myanmar, Rohini also mentioned Myanmar. I think that was really the eye opener to many of us when a, a UN mission in 2018 came out and said that Facebook had played a crucial role in facilitating the genocide against the Rohingya Muslim minority, right? Just consider that phrase in its own right. So, so astounding and I think in countries in the countries where I work, and which also then or, or which is the same cases in Myanmar, Facebook is in is the internet, and the internet essentially is Facebook. Um, 
and where you had a case in Myanmar where hundreds of personnel from the Burmese military, you know, sat in barracks outside of Yangon. They were trained in Russia, essentially having been flown into Russia, trained in, in acts of misinformation and engaged in heavy forms of, you know, spreading of hate, hate speech against the Rohingya minority, inciting violence through disinformation and misinformation. So I think that was really the true eye opener to to all of us of what the sort of the extent can be of the violence that can be incited through these platforms. So I think those two starting points to sort of say, if we look back across the 10 year anniversary now with the Arab Spring, we just see this radical shift in the narrative around social media. Um, but but and, and related to that, we see a radical difference between the implications when we look at you know Western democracies even by now, we know that the Russian involvement in the U.S. election in 16 did not have the effect that we perhaps thought it had at the time. And so vis-a-vis -vis the global south, we see far, far more grave consequences emerging uh, around the world than in, than in the West, so to speak. Thank you, Adam. I think sort of one of the one of the themes that comes through from each of your different expertise is this challenge of trying to hold these major social media platforms accountable, right? You say Facebook is the internet in some parts of the world. And there's certainly been a sense, I think, in the United States, for starters, that it's incredibly hard to sort of figure out how do you change the rules for the players that are that big and that powerful? How do you try to even begin to think about what it would mean to hold them accountable for the many very complicated roles they play in all sorts of political activities and, and protests around the world? And Manuela, I wanna come back to you. You mentioned the next DG law, the German online hate speech law, which I think was sort of a real landmark um, certainly for me and many of the people in my world as an example of a government saying, you know, it's ridiculous to say that there that, that it's too hard to hold any of these big platforms accountable for the content that's being posted on them, even if they are not the ones directly posting that content, even if it's their users. And I'm curious a few years out, sort of as you look back on that law and the impact it's had within Germany, what do you think are the important lessons that the rest of us can be learning from it? What do you think has worked well or not worked well? Well, the first lesson is it doesn't work as we have thought for a start. It's working just a bit. It takes too long uh, uh, for Facebook and others to take uh, content down, offensive concept down, uh, content down. And uh, it's very difficult to control what they are taking down and why. Uh, the whole process is too long. That means uh, the idea, I think, in my opinion, is, is good if it's managed well, but it's not really transparent. We don't know why are they taking some content down and why other content not, and what kind of content are they promoting and why are they promoting this content. It's very difficult to follow up which means uh, that's why uh, Germany is working already uh, together uh, with the European Union on a new kind of law to introduce uh, to have tighter regulations. And for my opinion, as a journalist, we really have to ask them, the, 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 the media, social media platforms, they have to be transparent. We really have to be able very quickly to find out why they are taking content down and others not. And uh, at the moment, it does, it's not working very well. And as Ada mentioned, uh, Ethiopia, uh, we have very difficulties to get information from Tigray, also because they shut down the internet uh, uh, totally. And for us as journalists, more or less impossible at the moment to report about the situation in Tigray. We have a correspondent there, but we can't communicate with him. We don't get any other information. And that's unfortunately with many countries the same. So coming back to your question, um, the German government attempted to balance these two uh, twin commitments as mentioned earlier uh, with its Network Enforcement Act, but it doesn't work very well, unfortunately. 
So Rohini, you talked a little bit about these shutdowns as well. And I'm, I'm curious when you look at some of the other efforts the Indian government has made, I know there's a lot of focus right now on WhatsApp and some of these other platforms. WhatsApp, of course, also being owned by Facebook is tied into to other larger regulatory questions. What do you think sort of the, the motivating force or the motivating goal for the Indian government is here when they launched these internet shutdowns? And what are the what are the factors that you think could sort of reverse that direction a little bit moving forward? Um. Yes, thank you. Um, so for the longest time, the government wasn't very open about talking about shutdowns. Public directives were not available. Um, now there is a Supreme Court order which mandates that the government uh, declares a public notification saying that they are shutting down the internet. Uh, uh, and these shutdowns are localized. It's a big country, so shutdowns are often... Uh, shutdowns are always uh, initiated by the local governments uh, wherever they happen. Uh, in terms of their motivations, there have been a range of reasons cited, including something like, uh, you know, preventing uh, uh, cheating in public examinations, um, uh, coordinated large-scale mass cheating in, in examinations, uh, for which they shut off the internet of the entire city. Uh, which is penalizing uh, a large population uh, for the misdeeds of, of a few. So uh, it's the stated motive is to, to control the law and order situation, but that is um, the job of the government. And uh, there is the government has never provided any evidence that shutdowns are working in, in that in their favor, that they are indeed controlling uh, the situation. Uh, and it is never done things like in, in places where shutdowns have happened, it's not tried things like uh, fighting misinformation with information. Uh, there was one incident in 2016 in the city of Bengaluru where uh, some spontaneous while violence and, and arson had erupted and the police department, which I mean, the, the city is called the Silicon Valley of India, the police department is very social media savvy. Uh, they uh, put out posts, uh, assuring, reassuring the public with, you know, put out posts on social media, uh, giving out updates about what's happening and, you know, how people can keep themselves safe and also warning them about how uh, they shouldn't use social media for spreading rumors or for, you know, malicious information or, you know, we'll find you and wallop you. And that sort of, uh, uh, the, the, the situation was under control in, in a day and a half, two days. Uh, so this was, I, I think, one of the rare examples of the, the government using uh, information to fight misinformation and assuring the public rather than leaving out, uh, leaving them out in the cold. Uh, but that's, I have not seen too many uh, instances of this happen in, in the case of shutdowns. In conflict-ridden areas like Kashmir, uh, the reasons cited are terrorism, you know, cross-border elements and so on. Kashmir was, was you know, a black box when, when the shutdown happened way back in uh, August 2019. Uh, and at some point there was 2G connectivity restored, but, you know, 2G internet speeds in this day and age uh, don't really work for, for anybody. And the pandemic happened uh, in, in the midst of all this. So it's, it's, it's just a human tragedy. Adam, I want to come back to a point you raised in your introductory remarks about sort of the very different implications um, in Western democracies versus the Global South, where you say you do most of your work for thinking about how these social media platforms have influenced daily life and politics and all of these other situations. What do you see as sort of the, the main inequalities or the main differences between those regions? Yeah, thanks. I think just adding to the, to the debate firstly before that, I think 
also and that resonates of course also with with the difference between sort of more western and the global south is you know we have this very strange private public conundrum when it comes to social media right so when when they when do something when the platform in certain ways we some including from political side where you would expect some understanding maybe or deeper understanding the response is often they can't do that or are they allowed to do that or why can they do that and we sort of we've come to the point where what are essentially are being considered public spaces and of course that's a huge huge issue in many ways because of course we cannot expect to have the sort of regulatory influence that we would have with something that is public because these essentially are private platforms. So I think that's one. I, coming back to your question, I think, you know, this is, this is extremely key and it also shows that the vast difference between social media in Western Europe, for example, vis-a-vis -vis in the parts of Africa where I work is that for many autocracies, it's a dream tool, so to speak, right? It's, uh, you know, you don't like how things are going on social media, you shut down the internet, right? You want to utilize the platforms, you have many different ways of weaponizing them, whether it's on your own, such as we've seen in Myanmar, or whether it's utilizing third parties. You know, we've seen a lot of Russian, a lot of Israeli firms specializing in disinformation uh, acts. So I think, you know, when I just return to something like Ethiopia or Ethiopia, where I spend a lot of my time, you know, you can't sort of take away critical infrastructure from the platform discussion because you simply put those two together and you have a dream scenario for, for certain countries and for a government such as that in Ethiopia, where if it's not satisfied with, you know, the public opinion going on on this public sentiment on social media, it can sub, it can just immediately turn off the internet and you sort of get rid of the problem. On the other hand, if you want to utilize it, you're completely free to do so because you have a you know a critical infrastructure built by other autocracies to a certain extent that help you essentially turn social media into these more or less dream tools, which of course is not a scenario you can have in Western Europe. You know, there's not a that in my country or in the UK or in the US, the internet could be shut down because the public center and is not sort of going to, or what do you say, following the government line, so to speak. So there's a huge difference in that regard, meaning that social media platforms in the context of the social or the global South, you know, are giving a, given a completely different role where you cannot sort of separate them from other forms of critical infrastructure and where they can be very much utilized in whatever way the sitting government would like to. So I'm going to ask one more question to all three of you, and then I'm going to open it up to others. So if, if folks in the audience have questions, I want to encourage you to go over and use the little raise hand function um, in Zoom, and I will, I will come to you in a few minutes. Before we do that, I want to ask each of you the same question um, from your different vantage points on how the social media landscape is playing out in different parts of the world. It feels to me a little bit like we're at this interesting inflection point right now, where on the one hand, many of these social media platforms have as much, if not more, power than ever before. They have more users. They have sort of more involvement in political life and all sorts of different things from news media to everything else. And at the same time, I would say in a lot of countries, we're seeing a really kind of more aggressive and more committed effort to regulate them than we've ever seen before. And sort of much more serious legislative language, much more kind of concerted effort towards governments trying to get a hold on some of these countries or, or to restrict them in various ways. And so I'm curious if each of you could say a few words about where you see this fight going, who you think is sort of poised to come out ahead between the governments, the social media platforms, the individuals using these platforms, and what you think sort of that, that balance of power is likely to look like a year or two or three down the road. Um, Manuela, I'm gonna to come to you first. Well, if I speak from a European perspective, I can say that uh, Europe is not very happy with these uh, social media giants. They want to know more about their algorithms. Why are users getting 
extreme content? Uh, why is this uh, content promoted for a start? And the European Union, they want to introduce the so-called Digital Service Act, where the social media guidance have to be more public about the algorithms and uh, have to are forced to uh, uh, regulate uh, certain content. Uh, it only applies if a company is really big, uh, has a minimum of 45 million uh, users. But uh, I think the European Union is pushing ahead with this Digital Service Act, and I think they will gain a lot of sympathy uh, with that. And so um, in the future, on the next two or three years, we will see in Europe, I think, more regulation and much more regulations than we see, for example, in the US. And certainly that's already been true to some extent, and it, it certainly looks exactly. like it can yeah. continue. Do you think it's going to be more effective regulation than that first wave of sort of the next DG? I think so, because it will be not just one country, it will be the European Union together. And of course, then they have more power to uh, get things changed. Excellent, thank you. Rohini, how about you? What do you see in sort of the next year or two coming? Uh, so social media companies, uh, especially the big tech companies, uh, they, are, they are all corporations. And uh, I believe their first interests would be to, to protect their own bottom line, to protect their own uh, existence and profits. And, and they have to uh, comply with local laws uh, wherever they go. So, um, I mean, it's it's. I see it as a lot more complicated than just power play between um, uh, uh, the the social media companies and uh, the government. And you know, which side will they cave in or will they hold out? Uh, will they cave in uh, to to the government's demands or will they hold out against? Uh, uh, you know, uh, unreasonable, unreasonable demands. I mean, that's uh, the the UN guiding principles for business uh, and human rights do say that uh, the government uh, that that corporate should take a stance, uh, even if the government is not uh, adhering to its own uh, laws, but in in you know if, in in its own jurisdiction. Uh, in India, Facebook, for example, has uh, a 10% uh, stake in one of the telecom companies, uh, which is called Geo, and the, com the uh, company is part of a large business conglomerate that has other uh, corporate interests as well. Um, and this is, this is social media and infrastructure, telecom infrastructure tying up uh, and you know it's it, th th this is where things get complicated. So I don't see it as as necessarily as a tug of war between uh, social media companies and the governments that want to regulate them. How about in the relationship between the Indian government and WhatsApp and the concern around end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services? Do you think that's going to sort of resolve in any settled way, or do you see that continuing to go back and forth? I do see that uh, going back and forth. Uh, also, WhatsApp is not the only platform uh, where a lot of uh, uh, you know disinformation and hate speech is going back and forth. Um, uh, Telegram, for example, uh, has been known to be a place where um, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, ISIS, for example, uh, or you know, Syrian extremists uh, were known to group and regroup and uh, uh, have broadcast channels and uh, circulate content, which was meant to be rebroadcast onto social media. Uh, very recently, an investigation by uh, an, um, a news media organization called The News Laundry in India uh, followed a public call for a similar exercise by, um, um, a, you know, far right uh, a politician from a far right party, and they found that they were doing the same same thing. They were they were gathering content on on a Telegram group, uh, 
which had thousands of of subscribers who had signed up explicitly to be a part of that group uh with specific tasks allocated to different people and uh they were uh sp spreading what i would call quote and quote propaganda uh on social media and the the messages to be broadcast were on that group and the supporting links were what what would qualify as misinformation or disinformation completely falsified fake news or or hoax you know th th that sort of uh, thing was used to support whatever claim was being uh, being used i'd be happy to share uh, the link to this investigation thank you adam over to you do you see sort of any any signs of hope in the research you do about how social media is being used how social media is being regulated or do you think it's sort of continuing on that trajectory you described since the Arab Spring of being less and less a uh, technology of liberation and freedom. I think it's a really good question. I mean, in terms of the balance of power, I, obviously I come from the home of uh, Margrethe Vistaya, the anti-competitive arriving the EU uh, targeting of tech giants and and even so, I mean, here, you know, at home here in Denmark, the prime minister mainly uses Facebook for communication. It's more or less it. There's very little other forms of direct communication with the public, whatever that public is on Facebook. Um, so, so my best guess is that EU, the EU will do as it always does. It'll be far too bureaucratic. It'll be far too slow. It will talk forever about digital sovereignty as it is doing at the moment and as Germany did uh, when it had the EU presidency this fall, but it'll do very little. It'll end up in discussions about whether, you know, should fine be so big or so big, even if we know that they have very little working on the ground or very little implications for the company. So I'm afraid that's more or less how it, it will be from the sort of, you know, public regulatory point of view. I'm sure there's going to be some work done, but I'm not convinced by it. I think if anything, when we look here in, in Western Europe, we should maybe try and be a little bit interested in the diversification we're seeing when it comes to social media. I'm not always sure how good this diversification is because something like, you know, TikTok obviously is, I cannot put into words how bad it is, but and I don't mean in terms of the content, but in terms of the build of TikTok. But, but, but to me, that seems to be the best hope that the diversification we're seeing of platforms and of services available can maybe create a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. So we've, we're seeing it a little bit with Signal and with the encryption sort of focus around that. I think personally, you know, and that's why I'm mentioning diversification, that I think it needs to come from users. I don't really see radical change coming from pol uh, politicians or from political side as things uh, stand right now. As Rohini says, we're dealing with massive corporations that, you know, in every aspect far outnumber, um, you know, whether it's financially, political and so forth, the power of most governments around the world. And there's not a chance that they're going to open and show things, you know, intimately about their APIs, about their algorithms, so forth. So I don't really buy that. Or I, don't, I don't see that as a realistic scenario. When it comes to the Global South, I think that the very, you know, unwelcome and the very unfortunate consequence right now is that it doesn't seem like we're going to see any change whatsoever. I mean, we're seeing an increasing focus to a certain extent on local moderation for companies such as Facebook, but it's still extremely limited. And, you know, <laughs> given the privacy, you know, the dominance of very few platforms in, in many of the countries, at least I work in, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not optimistic in that regard whatsoever. Thank you. That's never good to hear, but important for all of us to hear, no doubt. Um, I want to turn things over to the audience now. If you have a question, you can either turn on your video and just raise your hand on your video and I should be able to see you. Or if you hit on the participants button in your Zoom screen, there's a little raise hand function there as well. Arpita, go ahead. Hi. 
Hi, um, my name is Arpita. I'm a um, graduate student at Fletcher School uh, and a lawyer by profession. Um, I would actually like to build upon what Rohini mentioned that, um, you know, in terms of WhatsApp being uh, regulated by the government, um, what I have noticed in the past is that um, given, given the hold of the Indian government when it comes to regulating internet platforms, I think WhatsApp has unfortunately succumbed to a lot of the government demand because India happens to be the largest user base for both Facebook and WhatsApp, um, I think after Brazil. And, uh, you know, even the little steps towards kind of giving in to their demands has been seen with one opening a local office, which they did not have previously. And um, two, of course, with the entire election misinformation, which is um, taking over the world, they did agree to share metadata with um, the government. So uh, Rohini, I just wanted to ask you if you think that with the new intermediary liability regime, how do you think political um, communication or election misinformation might be viewed from a disinformation perspective? And do you think that um, apps like WhatsApp and Facebook might just see a similar fate to what happened to the Chinese apps? For context, the Chinese, uh, a bunch of Chinese apps mm -hmm. were actually banned in India um, owing to uh, national security reasons. So uh, just wondering if, you know, um, would like who would have like um, more power to kind of negotiate in this uh, scenario? Um, I'm not sure if the, the case of the Chinese uh, apps being banned, which were which for context for everybody else, uh, a bunch of Chinese apps were banned by the government and taken off uh, local app stores. Uh, uh, after uh, a standoff with uh, the Chinese government. Uh, uh, while they may have had a large user base like TikTok uh, or PUBG in India, uh, they did not serve any political purpose. Whereas, you know, Facebook or Twitter, as I mentioned, the news laundry investigation, for example, uh, or, you know, or previous documented examples of concerted uh use of hashtags uh around the time of elections i mean this sort of thing didn't happen on the chinese app so so the the two are not comparable because uh you know social media platforms like facebook and twitter like there are government departments on it uh the you know uh, politicians and government officials themselves use it in their official capacity um, I am not uh, very uh, well versed with, I'm, I'm not a lawyer either. I'm not very well versed with the new uh, uh, internet liability regime. So I'm afraid I won't be able to comment on that. Sorry, I would just like to clarify um, my question. It was not respect to uh, just being banned as TikTok or PUBG. But um, my question was more related to, do you think that there is a possibility that, you know, the government might just crack down on um, WhatsApp and Facebook, um, just like the Chinese apps, uh, given that they are uh, facilitators of uh, misinformation, disinformation? Well, I, I think that's, that's quite unlikely just because of the sheer user base uh, in India uh, and just how much, you know, Indians depend on it and its uh, network effects. Um, uh, including the government, including, uh, you know, everybody. So um, it's it's unlikely. I mean, there was this, recently there was an attempt to signal to Twitter uh, that uh, people might want to move, to migrate to another uh, local Indian version uh, of Twitter called Ku. Uh, but we don't see activity on Twitter dropping. Like this is, this is just anecdotal observation, but I don't see activity on Twitter dropping, whatever. I, I mean, there was some some talk of an exodus, but that, that didn't really happen. And, uh, you know, in 2019, there was also uh, a quote unquote exodus to Mastodon uh, in response to the accounts of, uh, you know, a lawyer and, and some other people being blocked and them being deplatformed. Uh, I sort of played a small role in that in triggering that exodus. But um, again, people switched to Mastodon. They kept their Twitter accounts. There was some activity. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of new accounts were created. People warmed up to the Fediverse. And then everybody was back on Twitter. <laughs>
so it's it's unlikely that uh you know they are going to block or ban these large social media sites what is possible is something that's more insidious is is that they will influence uh how content is managed and who gets to stay on this platform and who gets heard um you know things like <clears throat> surreptitiously restricting uh, likes or retweets um or sharing on so so the content stays but it's it's being uh, surreptitiously restricted i mean that's uh, that's something that's a, that's a lot more insidious and that has real implications for democracy thank you thank you other questions manuela yes Uh, I just want to, I just want to mention that users often also find ways around. Uh, for example, you do, one doesn't have access to our service uh, in Iran, so our uh, Farsi service can't be accessed from uh, Iran. But still, we have millions and millions of users. They just use proxy servers. Same applies to uh, China, for example. So, uh, thank God for that. Uh, that the users are clever and try to find their way around. And uh, so that sometimes work, of course, not always in the case of Myanmar or Ethiopia, it obviously doesn't work, but uh, sometimes it does. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. I'm not seeing other questions. So I'm going to have each of you give one minute of sort of what you think those of us who are on any of these social media platforms should be aware of or should keep in mind when we're using them that we're perhaps not thinking about that you think people do not necessarily sort of understand when they're interacting with or engaging with these platforms adam i'm going to come to you what's the thing that you think we should all sort of have front of mind if we're logging into facebook or twitter or any of the rest uh, that's a good question i think i mean i'm a complete hypocrite because i left facebook some years ago but then when i talk to people about it they're like oh but aren't you on instagram and i'm like oh yeah that's right so i mean i'm a, i'm a complete uh, hypocrite in that regard i think i think one of the most important things to consider especially you know it's the difference in audience between the different platforms is extremely important to understand and i think it's important for us with some you know you know a platform like twitter to not sort of equate it with an immediate democratization of anything so to not sort of automatically assume that the audience that exists on twitter is a reflection of the real world that we live in in any way because it is not you know it, and this is not just about the content obviously i don't think anyone in here needs to be told that what is shown on uh, on social media platforms is a is a sort of is an it's an edited reality of course but i think it's important not to automatically assume that, that we're dealing with a democratization where the people suddenly jump online and they can engage directly with politicians and it's a sort of all you know a, a positive for all i think when i look at, at twitter which is more or less the only sort of on a professional level that i'm engaged with you know the only thing i find mostly is echo chambers we talk about this all the time echo chambers and the audience mostly consists uh, consists of experts of specialists and then of right wing angry people i mean essentially that's how i view people or view twitter these days so i think i think it's very important to not automatically assume that you know social media platforms you know, result in a democratization or represent a democratization in any way because you know there's n there's nothing necessarily or guaranteed public about the audiences who use them about the discussions undertaken about the issues being discussed and, and the information being relayed so i think that's important then i think the other point just briefly is this public private conundrum don't try to you know assume that we're dealing with some public form of platform or that they think they have a public responsibility there's nothing public in any of this but we just assume sort of 
because they are so infringing upon our personal lives and upon the institutional lives that we live in our societies that they must you know be strongly related to public life but they are not they are essentially private and that's how they work and that's why they work as they do thank you Rohini, we're almost out of time, but give us in one minute what you think the one most important thing for us to be thinking about on social media is right now. Uh, that social media have far reaching consequences uh, for us as individuals, as societies and uh, a democracy as well. Uh, there was an uh, investigation by Kashmir Hill a few years ago, which documented how Facebook uh, has a shadow profile for everyone, including uh, people who don't have a Facebook account, if their friends and family, if, if someone they know has, has a Facebook account, Facebook probably has a behind the scenes profile of uh, them. Facebook has patents for, you know, identifying your camera, phone camera uniquely based on the scratches on, on your camera. It's it's a lot more than what we think of during the course of our day to day lives in, in our interactions when we easily log into uh, an app or or from from our browser about how far reaching and how 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 deeply embedded uh, the roots of uh, social media are and they have the capacity to manipulate us uh, and not necessarily in ways that that we would want to us meaning individual societies and democracies thank you and manuela same question what should we be keeping in front of mind <laughs> Okay, I just want to say, never think that something you post on your private accounts that it is really private. That's, I think, one important message, uh, which many people unfortunately don't understand. I nearly every day I have to face the things my colleague posted on their private private accounts and somehow people, organizations are complaining and so on. And also another thing I would like uh, the uh, tech giants uh, to be public more, so that we have more information about their algorithms, more transparency is needed for sure. Thank you so much. Um, please join me in thanking Manuela, Rohini and Adam for this really wonderful conversation. I wanna also thank Susan and Uta for organizing this and all of you for joining us uh, for this really important and timely discussion. Thank you so much and take care. Okay. Ciao. <laughs>